Hello, and we are back with series two of Rocket Pod. We've had a few weeks off, but we now have 12 more episodes, and over the next three months, you're going to have the opportunity to hear firsthand from some of the most successful visionaries from across the world. And joining us for series two include the founder of Photobox, Graham Hobson, best selling author, Daniel Priestley, and even the founder of the most successful cheetah conservation fund in Africa, Dr. Laurie Marker. You're going to want to hit that subscribe button as these are conversations you do not want to miss. As of course, RocketPod is made up of three generations of entrepreneurs. So it's myself, Harry Damon, we've got James Cuss, and of course, producer Peter Haynes. And without further ado, it's time to get series two underway. And for the first episode, we are sitting down with the founder of my PT hub, Phil Carr. Enjoy. Yeah, I, uh, so my background is all within like, technology. So I, um, I founded my first business roughly around about seven, eight years ago. So my PT Hub, um, which is the company that I run at this moment in time, uh, wasn't my first tech business that it is that I had. But looking, looking further back than that, um, I was 15 years old when I built my very first website. And that was to help uh, my local football team uh, essentially work out what games we had coming up in our in our in our small Sunday league if you if you like Um, and it was because I just wanted to know in advance where it is that we were going what games it is that we were playing and who we would expect to see from there so using uh, back in the day macro weaver dream weaver I don't know if anybody remembers that that application yet so it was all built using tables um, which was which was fun and games Um, so yeah I, I built that when I was 15 years old and I kind of just seemed to to click with it. And the thing that I liked the most about it was when you when you took something and you and you you broke it, the computer would tell you why or how you broke it. And I used to love I used to love that kind of a feeling of going, oh, I can fix this or I can do that. And you end up just you know spending hours and hours and hours trying to work out why you've done something. And then suddenly you would go, oh, that's a new way of being able to do it. And then that would open up a whole new you know chain of events or thought processes so it's kind of sparked from there really of where understanding how the technology works being you know how that's all put together and then subsequently over the course of you know the last 10 to 15 years or so transitioned much more into the business side of things understanding uh how how an online business grows how you drive traffic towards it and more importantly how does it how does that turn into economic success uh to then ultimately exit and sell from that so it really stems from an early age um, of it's, it's not been a case of, Oh, I just had an idea for an app and decided to jump into technology. It was because I was, I was here from an early, from an early age, not going, Oh, I wanted to be a, a, you know, a tech founder in any way. It was more, this was just an interesting way. It was a, um, it was, it was a new, a, a new style of marketing that wasn't putting together a flyer or a leaflet on, word 97 at the time um, using clip art or something along those lines to be able to produce it so it's um yeah i guess, I guess that's 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 where it all started from and um and uh, you know and, and me in you know in a basic nutshell that's, that's really interesting so you mentioned on a previous conversation that you you were very good at breaking things so you and, and just now you mentioned that you found out that the computer was you know really good at telling you what was wrong or what what was broken did your curiosity or your ability to break things, did, did that happen before the computer did it for you? Or is that when you first got inspired to actually look at how things can be broken? Or, um, or is it just the way you're, you kind of, you're wired? Um, I think it's a mixture of a number of things, really. I've always been the sort of individual which is, um, you know, the old saying of uh, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, kind of uh, the explanation from that. It's really where I, the way I've always been has, if I've, if I've set my sights on something and I wanted to be able to achieve something, then I, I've done it. And once I've achieved it, I've then gone, right, what's the next thing? And you move on to that. I did that from when, you know, it was goalkeeping and moved into playing for Sussex and having, having trials at a Premier League football team through to um, learning to play the drums and getting to grade seven on that to uh, learning to DJ and playing for the ministry of sound and doing once I kind of got to the point of where I was like, Oh, I feel like I've, I've mastered this or this is where it is that I want to be able to go. Suddenly the, um, you know, the the desire to want to, to continue in that seems to diminish. And that's not, I guess that's not because I get necessarily, 
dissatisfied with what it is I'm doing. It's because I'm like, right, what's the next thing? And I'm consistently inquisitive about that. So, mo- so look, kind of leading on to the question that you asked around breaking things and starting again, I've always gone, I've always looked at a particular individual in an, in an industry and gone, how do they do something and how can I do something similar to that? So when it comes to technology and web side of things is there will be certain designers, there'll be certain web programmers or what have you of where I will look at what they've done and I will try to take that apart and go, how, why, or how did you do that in a certain way? So building the first website wasn't a case of, you know, starting with a blank canvas and going, where do I begin? It was more a case of using a template and understanding how that template was put together and once you kind of start to understand, you know, how, you know, the mechanisms behind that, so that then helps to um, helps you to build the product it is that you're wanting to be able to do. And take, for example, drumming that I used to do uh, a long time ago. When I got into that, that was never a case of, um, it was never a case of picking up, um, you know, a music book and understanding drumming music and going, well, what does that note mean? Why is that doing that? It was oh, that's a song I really like. I want to learn to play that song. And once you've learned to play that song, it's like you then, after you know doing that for a year, a year and a half or so, you start to then learn the academic stuff behind it of, of, of where you're going. So it's more a case of just getting, rolling your sleeves up and getting your hands dirty and understanding how these things are put together. Um, having that mindset and then running a business tend to go hand in hand from my experience, which is never do a job you know, you know, sorry, uh, never ask somebody to do a job that you're not prepared to do yourself. So even down to doing customer support, and I, you know, that was me at the beginning. Doing the marketing, that was me at the beginning. Building the design of the website, that was me at the beginning. Now there are people that are far better and talented at doing those, you know, sectors than I am, but at least I've got an appreciation of how those things are done. So when you can have a conversation with someone, you can say, oh, okay, I get what you're talking about here. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I guess that does that. I don't know if that answers the question specifically, but it's um, it's more yeah, just breaking things, understanding what they are, and then once you feel like you've got them and you've you know you've you've semi mastered that, I then want to sort of broaden my skills further and move on to the next thing. No, it makes it makes sense, and I, I like the idea of um, yeah, you're looking at other folks that have been successful or they've achieved a certain thing, and then you've deconstructed how they've done it. You've asked why they've done it. And then perhaps rebuild it in a better way, you know. So you're almost taking what's worked and maybe make it better, or just your natural curiosity to kind of break down things into like easy bites. Um, so that that um, that's how I kind of interpreted it. But it's um, okay. That thank you. It's really interesting. And in amongst all the DJing and the football and everything else going on, when at what point did you suddenly realise there's there's a gap in the market for my PT Hub? What inspired you to 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 create this idea and would you be able to just give us a little bit of background about that and how you came to this idea yeah sure so so my um one of my best friends a guy called lewis who's actually our uh chief operating officer now um he was my he was my personal trainer uh back in 2013 2014 we used to train in haywards heath in in sussex and i uh, I was, uh, I, he, he always knew that I was into tech. I built his first little website for him. So in fact, actually I built his website and he gave me free personal training sessions at the time. <laughs> Great. And I, re- I remember, I remember saying to him when we were in the gym, cause we used to kind of go after hours, uh, in, you know, so we, you know, we didn't, we got access to all of the equipment. So, you know, in the gym that he managed. And I remember, I remember saying to him at the time, why are you giving me these, pieces of paper with my workouts on that I'm supposed to bring to the gym every single time and or you know I would sit with him in the gym office and he would have a number of other clients and you would see him writing up the workouts for the next day for his clients and the amount of times that I watched him word the right the word so write the word biceps or bench <laughs> or cable <laughs> there's got to be a better way of being able to do this you just consistently are just repeating how many times have you written a chess workout today? <laughs> oh, i've got four people that are doing that tomorrow and you just think to yourself like well could you not just use a photocopier or something to make this better yeah. and 
so, so we you were kind of you know, it was one of those things of where we were you know our <laughs> our bloodstream was kind of flowing with caffeine at sort of nine ten o'clock at night to better try and see if we could get any sort of pump before we went into the gym or, or what have you <laughs> and um I guess this is kind of stemming from the days of, you know, DJing of being well and truly awake still at one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, so anyway, I, I kind of, um, I said, I'm going to try and see if I can build an app that, that doesn't replace you as a personal trainer, but complements what it is that you're doing. I would love to be able to have something where I can walk into a gym and I work with you You've already created a workout, but you can create it once and you can send it to as many clients as you want to be able to do. So you're reducing your admin work. And I have an app that I can use on my phone when I walk in and I can log what I'm doing and then simply just track whether I'm ahead or whether I'm behind what it is that I wanted to be able to achieve. Um, so, so it was kind of in, it was in January of 2015 that I thought, let's just do this. Let's go for it. Um, the very first version of my PT Hub, if I look back now, my God, what a car crash that was <laughs> um, in terms of its aesthetics, its functionality. But do you know what? It worked and it ticked the box. It ticked the box of a personal trainer could create a workout. They could send it to their client. Their client could log it and I could book in for a session with my trainer and I knew what was coming up. That was it. It was. It, it had no other levels of functionality with it. It was. It was the definition of a real MVP that kind of got off the ground. And it took us. It took us about five to six months to be able to build. So it was. It, it was very small. It was very lightweight. Um, so the inspiration behind it was the fact is that I just used to see my best friend training me, going, yeah. "This is terrible." But but one thing just to note here is that. During that development process, my PT Hub was not the first player to the market. There were a number of other people that were in that space, and, and that typically puts people off. Is they go, "Oh, someone's already done it, therefore I don't need to do it." Whereas I kind of took a, I've always taken a different approach, which has been, "Oh, there's a market here. That clearly means that there are some people that are making money." Yeah. Or I'm not necessarily saying go and build a watch that's on your wrist that can sync with your phone and track your fitness because there are some bigger players in that market that might be slightly difficult to go up against. But typically there's not usually a massive player in a market that you're in. There might be three or four people that are trying to hustle their way into a space or you diversify in some way, shape or form. But it's really a case of there were a few people in there and I, I looked at what they did and went, I can do this a lot better than what they can. Um, and you know, aesthetically, we built something better. Um, they weren't available on mobile. We were available on mobile at the time. So it was, it was a way of going, I had a problem. Clearly, the solutions that were on the market were either not known about by a lot of personal trainers at the time, or they weren't fit for purpose. So we developed that and built that. Um, and I guess the rest is history, really, around, yeah. you know, what's happened since. That's brilliant. Now, that sounds, that sounds really interesting. And actually, I'd be interested to focus on the period between that idea and that MVP. So you mentioned that there are competitors, there were competitors at the time in the market that were doing similar sorts of things, but you had that, that mindset where you just said, I want to take it on. I'm going to start developing that first minimal viable product. What was that like? Because we're going to have a lot of listeners that maybe do have an idea or have suddenly spotted a gap, maybe as a result of COVID, maybe not where they've thought, actually there's a, there's a potential market for this, but haven't either got the funds or haven't got that mindset to say, let's give it a go. What advice would you give to them that maybe at that stage? And what was that experience for you like saying, I'm going to give it a go? Yeah. So I guess what I would do is there's a, there's a number of factors that come into play here, right? Is that if you are a company that is massive, then you want to be able to build something and you feel like you've got unlimited levels of resource and cash in your company, then your version of an MVP will be different to that of somebody who's, you know, as we, as we spoke just before this, who's setting something up in their, their grandparents' spare bedroom yeah. or something, some way, shape or form. Right. But, my my answer to this is when people ask me about it is you need to be extremely critical over what it is that you're trying to achieve. And there is, firstly, it is a good thing if you've got more ideas than you know how to be able to develop and deploy to begin with. 
and try and see if you can flip it on its head in a way of when we built my PT hub to begin with, it was what, what, it, what really does this product need to be able to do to, in order to be able to say it can do something. So could we build an app whereby you don't invite any clients to it? Your clients can't kind of access to it. Maybe, maybe you could, maybe you could have a piece of technology that produces a PDF, but now we're taking things back offline again to be able to do it. So it defeats the object. Do we need to do nutrition? No, we don't have to do nutrition. Do we need to do payments? No, we don't need to do payments essentially. But one thing that we do need to do is you typically work with a personal trainer in a gym and to do your workouts, right? So it has to do workouts. You have to add your clients Mm. and the trainer has to be able to gain access to it. So, Everything else stems from that. So if you're kind of drawing a mind map or, you know, you're brainstorming things or whatever the the right political term is to use against doing that sort of process, really, really cut down on what it is that you need to be able to do. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with setting a website up that has a certain feature which says grayed out and says coming soon in it into there there's there's nothing wrong with doing that people seem to think that when they launch an app they need to be all things to all men to be able to begin with yeah and what a lot of people um don't realize is when you're building technology is they know that you need to continuously update it but they don't know what that actually means so they think that by building a website they compare it to that of building a product or where i've built it it's been manufactured and then I've now shipped it and it's now with my customers, right? However, with a website, you could launch something and it'd be really basic, but two weeks later, you could have a small update for it. Then another week later, you have another update for it. So before you know it, you know, within the first month, you've already done two updates to the site already. Mm -hmm. So it's consistently evolving. So my advice to somebody who would be setting something up who has limited resource, not just from a people perspective, but also financially, Get something basic up there, get something you know really raw and just focus your time and attention on consistently making that product better and better and better. Web stuff these days is all about the product. It's all about it. Do, worry less around how am I, how is this going to commercially scale and grow because the commercial scale will come as the product becomes better and better. Yeah. How many apps do you have on your phone that you use which you only use it because the user experience and the product itself serves a purpose. So if WhatsApp turns around to, I mean, WhatsApp a bit different, maybe a different story, you know, with what's going on at the moment around the privacy side of things. But for example, right. If WhatsApp turned around to everybody tomorrow and said, Oh, it's 59 P for an app or it's 40, 49 P for an app or something. I wouldn't be at all surprised that the vast majority of people pay for it because that's what they're used to. And that's where it is that they sit to be able to have with it. But because the user experience of it ticks a box, it, it does what you want it to be able to do. Um, so keeping, keeping it simple, keeping it easy and not trying to do too much and spread yourself thin is, 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 is where I'd say. So yeah, just be very, very critical of, of what you need yeah. and, um, and ask other people as well um, throughout that process. I'd like to take this moment to introduce to you our sponsor, Flexi, the must-have app to track and manage your subscriptions in one place. So most of us have multiple subscriptions nowadays for things like streaming services, gym memberships and food deliveries. These are great and take the hassle out of buying everyday products that we consume regularly, but it can be hard to keep track of them. That's where Flexi comes in handy, using super secure technology to connect your accounts to see all your subscriptions in a single dashboard, putting you in control of your spending. And what's more, Flexi subscription marketplace allows you to discover new products you may love, or easy to pause, resume, or cancel in a swipe or two. So give Flexi a try, it's free to download from the App Store, or check out their website at www.flexiapp.uk. That's F-L-E-X-Y app.uk. Back to the podcast. Brilliant, no, no, that's a brilliant bit of advice. And actually, yeah, it's like you say, it's that not going direct to the end result, which is where you have all the capabilities features of the, what does going back to you said a piece of paper it's writing down bicep each day it's simple stuff and then developing it from there i think that's brilliant so 
I guess for me, from there, where did the journey take you? So you had your mineral byproduct, you released it to the market, you started getting feedback. Where did that journey take you next? So it was in August of 2015 is when we had our first customer. Uh, and I remember it well. Um, so we, we charged monthly or annually and they bought an annual for £250. And I thought, uh, it felt, do you know what? It felt really good. And I'll tell you why it felt really good was because I don't know this person. I've never met them in my, in my entire life. And they have signed up to a trial and they've paid for it with, without me pushing them. With, they did it off their own, you know, off their own back. And they are willing to part with their own money to buy something which six months earlier was just a concept and there was nothing there. So that proved at that point that you are now in business because you have achieved something that somebody else wants. And it was a case of, right, how can we refine that and make that better? So it felt, it felt, it felt really good at the same time as it now felt that things were real and I have levels of responsibility. To, to own up to it's the difference between somebody charging for free if you you know if it's free then a lot of people will go oh it doesn't matter it's free but whereas when someone's actually giving you money for it you suddenly feel like you have a level of responsibility uh to um to kind of keep up the level of service it is that you've that you've got in play um but i guess the question was more kind of based around um how's the product grown and how's it was what's it done over the course of that you know the last six years so it's it's grown exponentially actually and it's been a, it's been one of these cases of being right place at the right time that the and, and i don't genuinely i don't mean in the last 12 18 months kind of being this business that's happened to be um that's happened to have done well uh, through through the pandemic because we've you know we've been te- a technology product that you can use anywhere or you know at any at any time to be able to work with your trainers or you know track your fitness but we've been one of these companies that's been at the forefront of pioneering the notion of uh online uh, and offline personal training so typically a personal trainer would work in the four walls of their gym in a physical location you would go and see them and you would you would interact with them maybe two three times a week for an hour or so at each time but we, we built the product around the ability for trainers to be able to uh, offer, you know, have an extension on their business model. So being able to say, oh, I want to be able to work with my trainer. My trainer might be in New York and the client might be in London. I want to be able to pay them through the application. And so the product itself has built its features around levels of automation to be able to enable a trainer to be able to, to work with their clients remotely. So I can track what they're doing. I can integrate with all sorts of different hardware products. Um, I have the ability to take payments online. I can, you know, I can do video calls with them through. I can do all my chat functionality, all of those sorts of things. But everything is branded around the personal trainer. As far as the client's concerned, they have no idea that my PT Hub exists. They, they go, oh, I'm, look, at, look, at the, look at the benefits that what my personal trainer is providing me. Imagine that you've got like a um, an Apple Fitness or a Sweat.com or um, some of these consumer-facing fitness apps. See my PT Hub as kind of the the CRM or the the content management system that sits over the top of those. So we enable the trainer to interface with us to build all the workouts, do all of their administration. Everything's then bundled up packaged into an app which is branded as if their own, and then distributed to their clients. So their clients feel like they're using the equivalent of a B2C app, but with their trainer. And then they're paying for the privilege to be able to be part of that. So, you know, and we've, we've extended our revenue streams out. We, you know, we, we charge for, um, for building your own iOS app and putting it on the app store. You know, we, we have payment processing with inside it now. So we're able to, you know, obviously monetize elements of, of that going through it. But back in 2015, I never thought that that would be where we were at. And, trying to if if you if you wanted me to write that down at the time and say where do you think that you'll be in three or four years time i think it's such a stupid question to ask somebody because it's think how the hell am i supposed to know <laughs> uh, you know it's and that's uh, okay <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's fine like you know it's like well i think we'll be going in this direction everything's just strategic guesswork right and 
and you think, well, why am I putting together all of these forecasts and all these budgets of where I'm going to be in three or four years time? And you think, I've only been in business six months. How am I supposed to know any of this? So it's, it's more a case of just trusting in where you're going and just consistently make the product better and better and better and listening to what your customers are saying. If every month that goes by, you're doing slightly better than the previous month and you're going in the right direction, then cool. Just keep focusing on that. Keep building that. And don't get too caught up in this world of, oh, you know, we're, we're slightly off budget. Our forecasts aren't quite where it is that we were at. And you think it's, it's not, it's, it, for starting a business, it's not the right, the, not the right angle to be able to come with. Um, and, and don't kind of get suckered up into that world. <laughs> so, so actually, just something to um, perhaps ask you. So obviously you, you had your, initially you, you solved the initial problem um, that uh, your friend Lewis was having as far as, you know, this repetitive writing down and the app solved a lot of those problems. Um, you then obviously structure a business around it um, and you have a vision of where you, even if it's six months in the future, it might be short term, but you have a vision to actually to build this thing. Um, to the point we actually get your first paying customer. Um, then you talked about the, I guess, the roadmap of, you know, adding new features as you go. And, you know, you quite rightly said you can't predict three years ahead. However, um, how much of it is, is vision and gut versus the data piece? Because a lot of, uh, I mean, you, hopefully you agree, uh, a lot of customers don't know what they want because it hasn't been invented yet. So you're almost like inventing the, uh, you know, I get, what's that saying? The best way to predict the future is to, is to create it. So uh, how much of it is data to develop the product versus vision and, and gut? Um, in your experience. I think the vast majority of it is vision and gut. If I'm, if I'm being brutally honest with you, um, because what what a lot of customers will do and this is no no this is no fault is um mainly just due to the fact is that they don't necessarily live within technology and they don't they, they don't know um kind of the iceberg analogy of what's sitting underneath the surface of what it is that you've got to be able to create and to be able to produce but also um when you're talking to a customer around vision is that one customer's i really want this is another customer's please don't change that and it's your it's it it's it's your decision making as the the product owner or as the founder of that particular business to make the decision around what is best for all of my customers what I'm trying to be able to produce because you're not building individual products for each of these customers you're building one thing which is trying to automate as much as you possibly can and you're in the luxury position of where you can kind of go up in a helicopter and have a vision around well this is what all these people are using 80% of my customers are using the workout feature, but only 5% of them are using the, uh, this little bit that I've got over here. Right, I'm going to focus more of my time on this part because this is where the product is being utilized the most. So using data helps to drive product direction about where you're going. But also a lot of this is around your own vision about where it is that you see, see things going and where you're at. I, I at heart, um i would i would define myself more as a new product development guy or individual i'm somebody who enjoys looking for new products new solutions new ways of being able to do things and will question that it's just the experience of knowing how to do that and how to execute that um is is where the two kind of go hand in hand so I, I will listen to a lot of customers and I will listen you know, to what they say. And what you'll often find is when a customer says to you, I want to be able to do this, there'll be two sentences out of about six or seven paragraphs that's actually meaningful. Everything else is like, this is my day. This is how much it's, you know, there was, there was an interesting YouTube video I was listening to from the guys who built um, Basecamp, it was originally called 37 Signals. Um, and... One of the quotes that I love the guy in there talking about was how this, this customer, um, it's a base kind of a project management tool, and how this customer was contacting them and said, like, they couldn't order a to-do list in terms of level of priority. And that was a feature that they said was just, I need this, it's ruining my life. You know, kind of really ranting and raving at this company saying, you need to better have this in place. And the development team are sitting on the other side of it thinking to themselves, so because you can't order to do 
it's, it's the end of the world. Like you can't do these sorts of things. And so, but there were loads of other people that were just saying, oh, it's fine. I just, you know, I just add it to the to-do list and I'll find it on my list and I'll tick it off and I've done it. And it's, it, this is what I mean in terms of the level of priority around people can sometimes skew your, your product vision. To really understand what it is that you want to be able to, where you're going and what you're doing, because no one will understand it better than than you, and no one will have as many touch points as what as what you do in, in the business. Um, now, obviously, if there's, you know, a thousand people saying I really want this, nine times out of ten you've already thought about it anyway. <laughs> in terms of oh, that would be a nice idea to have. Um, I remember the list of features and updates that I wanted to be able to do um, that I would share with our development team and then the list of features that I would keep privately because I knew that if I shared the ones that I kept privately with them, they'd look at them and go, how the hell am I supposed to do all this sort of stuff? You know, I remember it's, one of ours was I, I want to be able to, you know, I want to be able to have our own, you know, become our own domain registrar and I want to be able to build our own website because I think it would be brilliant for a trainer to be able to use that, to be able to do lead generation and what have you. I remember talking to one of our devs about it and they just said, you don't realize the level of work that's behind that. And I'm not, I think I've got an idea of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to build it. We might partner with someone to work on that, but it's something in the future that I kind of want to add. Um, and I think it would be a good place of being able to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I think it comes down to you as an individual, whether you're a product person and whether you can really, you know, you, you can really see that, uh, but only take a small pinch of what, customers are necessarily saying because nine times out of ten you've either thought about it or um it's just trying to solve something that, that that's only for them as opposed to the the rest of the uh the customer base that you have on the product i wanted to touch on actually so you mentioned about kind of the customers that um want, want change and stuff but actually something that we've all been facing over the last sort of year is is quite is a quite a big change um and now you mentioned earlier on that with the effects of covid you've you've actually it's, it's been it hasn't affected you too much but i wanted to just understand what has been the effect of COVID for you as a business have you had to adapt obviously with gym shut and all that going in and out of lockdown, all the restrictions, what has the effect been on your business and how have you had to adapt? Um, yeah, very, very good question. So I think there's, there's two answers. There's, there's two ways of approaching this is we've had to adapt internally and we've also had to adapt our outward facing message at the same time. So if I start internally first is like, like every business that operates in an office, or has an environment of that, um, it's been extremely difficult to be able to um, culturally work with people that you don't that you're so used to seeing every single day. Our our culture at work has always been, you know, very relaxed, but also very you know individuals that knew when it was serious time and when it was fun time, uh, and, and being able to chop and change between that. And we, you know, every, there's, there's no kind of like shrinking violets uh, in, in my PT hub. Everyone is, you know, quite energetic. Um, they really enjoy being around other people. You know, we've got a gym in the office. We have table tennis. We have PlayStations. We have all of those sorts of things like, you know, beer available in the fridges all the time, that kind of side of thing. And then suddenly overnight, it's go home, work from home, be, be, be in your own environment. And we had to kind of juggle this. Um, yeah, I say I, I, we're, not, we're not the only individuals that have been in this. So, you know, maybe this, this sort of thing resonates with other people that are listening. But you've got, you've, you know, not only have you got the operational side of things of now being able to communicate with people and understand and, you know, really use technology in a different way using, you know, using video, using Slack, using these sorts of communications to make sure everyone's, you know, are, uh, you know, on the same on the same track but but more from a case of making sure that everybody is mentally all right and their working environments are okay i think we 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 probably don't know yet the level of damage that this has done to people from working at home and not being around other people i remember walking i was i was out with a um 
uh, with my wife uh, at the weekend and we were just walking around Linfield in Sussex, you know, a little village. And it was probably about six or seven people that we passed. And I, I got up, just stopped and said to myself, it's always quite busy, isn't it? And you think, I've just passed six or seven people. Like it's, it's, it's crazy how this kind of notion of being separate with it. But, but, but looking at work related side of things, it's, there are certain people in the company that I physically haven't seen in nearly a year that I used to every single day have a game of table tennis with, or we would talk about, we would have a coffee in the morning. Um, we would walk down to Costa or Nero and we would catch up and we would have a good chat about things. That kind of notion has started to leave. But one thing that we did try to do is we introduced a, um, a little product or a little app onto Slack called Donut that every single, I don't know if you guys have seen it or used it. It's quite cool. Um, but what it does is it checks the calendar of your day to see when it is that you're available and takes 10 minutes out of your day and then automatically bumps you into a chat. It's 10 video call and talk to each other. And we, we said on it, you're not allowed to talk anything to do with work. It's what are you up to? You know, how are you doing? Uh, and that could be me talking to a newest member of staff that's just joined our customer service team that I've never even met. Um, and, I've barely spoken to and some of the things that I've, worked, I've I've found out from people has been really interesting one of one of our designers I realized that she was um she was on the set for one of the Star Wars films didn't know anything about that and I said well what, what bit were you in she goes oh well um when there was a scene of where Darth Vader was walking through um I don't know the Death Star or I, I don't know what I don't, I'm not really a big Star Wars fan so apologies to anybody who are but um the like the props and stuff in the background moving they're strapped to people and they're just sitting there so people are just standing behind kind of like doing this sort of like little waving dance and she said oh i was inside one of the boxes on the floor like moving so when the st when it looked like it was it wasn't on hydraulics it was just me sitting inside a box and the thing is is i never knew that but it's it's using it was using donut that forced us into a position to have a conversation around you know sparking questions of tell me something that I probably wouldn't know about you. And, you know, and, and having that, it was just quite interesting to find out. So culturally it's been different for us, like a lot of people to be able to do it. So it's, it's just kind of embracing that and, and trying to um, try and be involved and, and maintain that kind of like flat hierarchy that we've always had where it's always been an open door for people to be able to talk to who they want. But externally, um, looking at our customers uh, and moving forward it's it is not um we we have been we've been one of these businesses that have been um i don't know if, i don't know if luck is the right word but there's definitely some degree of luck in it in some way shape or form that you know right place right time and we have we've you know we've built a product which um you can use without having to be face to face with people and it, and, it work, and it works well. However, this is not a time for us to, to profiteer from that. This is not a time for us to um, rub it in people's faces. This is not a time for us to gloat and say, oh, look at us, you know, we've been telling you for the last four or five years that you should be doing online personal training. Ha, 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 you should have listened to us kind of attitude and practice towards it. In fact, actually, we've done the opposite, which is there are features in our product that we used to charge for which we gave away for free there were education elements that we took on board for the product which we gave away for free there were clubs that were using our product which they've now noticed that you know 30 percent of a club's revenue stream comes from personal training wiped out overnight so it's a case of going right how can we work with these individuals to help their businesses at the moment because when this stuff is over uh, or I say back to some form of normality we will be the name that people remember throughout that process so when oh these guys helped us oh and they really helped us through this period so we're, so it's you're you're helping people at this moment in time to hopefully benefit commercially later down the line and that is now starting to come true with um with a lot of our bigger chain customers that we work with are starting to get involved with us now on what i would define as more of an enterprise level of where we've gone, oh, we, before we only charge monthly or annually for something, now we've got people that are prepared to spend 250, 300, 400,000 pounds a year with us on a licensing agreement because they've seen um, that our technology 
can help their business and they've gone well if something like this happens again we sure as hell do not want to be in the same position that we were in before let's work with the people that helped us so now you're in a position of where you're not only you know genuine people you've helped people out in times of where it's been difficult but now their businesses are starting to kind of get back on their own two feet again but you're already in the door and you're already helping them and I feel better doing that you know than than being somebody that's going to go oh okay but you suddenly need my product right I've now hyped my price up and because you'd be paying the price of that now um with, and and so that I guess that's our approach towards it really has been just help where we can help um both internally and externally but when when businesses are able to kind of get back involved with us again that's when the commercial talk needs to be because people have gone right I now I now know what my position is moving forward I, lo- I love the way that you've taken you know a difficult situation and actually you know turned it around and doing something really good um you did touch on the fact that uh you know the pandemic even though you know the business obviously has found a way through this and you know it, it's um enhanced it in some ways um you know the, the, the cultural element has struggled a bit with the fact that you're not you know in that that human contact um can you um ref- can you maybe um explain to our listeners some of the you know your relationship with struggle and obviously there's good times and bad times with any business and even kind of taking you back from the the, the early days um can you talk about some of the the, the tougher times that you've been through and and you know and how you've obviously you've, you've just given an example of how you've handled the the current pandemic uh because i think it's good to for our listeners to understand that you know things aren't always rosy um can you comment on that maybe maybe things have always been rosy but um can you talk no. about your relationship with struggle and and some of the yeah, the tougher times that you've you've had to go through as a individual and also um the business yeah no absolutely um i can i can think of a number of situations of where it's definitely been tough and and actually funny enough when you when you look back you think of more of the tough times than you do of thinking of the wins that you've had um because you know you know as as human beings if you know like if you look at a social media post and there's 20 positive messages and one negative funny enough you'd listen to the negative one you you ignore all the positive ones uh well i Sure as I sure as hell know that that's what I've done before. Um, I think there's there's a number there's a number of ways to kind of approach that. And um, the first one I'm actually going to answer it with is is, is personally, and um, how at the beginning I'm the sort of individual who I, I've become not harder in a sense of all oh, like he's he, you know he's trying to you know draw blood from a stone. Or what I mean in terms of that is. When I first started my PT Hub, I really did wear my heart on my sleeve. And I took a lot of, I take a lot of pride in what, what we had designed and what we had built. And I found it very, very difficult mentally when somebody would send a message going, I think this software is a load of rubbish. You know, what are you doing? It doesn't work. It's, it's, I want my money back. I want to cancel right now. And it's hard not to take that personally. If you put something up online saying here's a new product or a feature that we've been working on for six months and the first comment you get on it saying is why are you launching new features when this one doesn't work and you think oh like oh, it's and, and sometimes it's everyone out there is to kind of like you know hammer you batter you down at the points of when it is that you're trying to actually you know move forward so i think personally it's it's been difficult over the last six years to kind of curb what you listen to and what you don't listen to. You know, you hear a lot of celebrities saying, I don't Google myself. I don't look at myself online because they know that there's going to be stuff on there that comes up of where someone's trying to talk negative about what they're doing. So what I would say from that angle is don't always take things to heart. People aren't having a go at you personally. They're having a go at the product and you can't please everybody uh, as much as it is that you want to and you take pride in that. Other times of where financially it has been extremely difficult. I remember when the bank account had £7,000 in it and I had about £20,000 worth of costs going out in the next two weeks. How the hell am I going to match up that difference in it? But you find ways of being able to scrape money together, whether that's from existing investors or whether that's from friends and family that will spot you through that period of time. I, I uh, I don't say that this is the right attitude or the right angle to take at all. 
Um, but I got myself into quite a large amount of financial debt to help with the business when I, to begin with, which is being able to take out personal loans and using credit cards to be able to pay for certain things because you trusted and you believed in where it is that you were going. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that someone should be racking up debt to be able to get where, they, that, where they're at, but it's a means to where it is that you're going uh, and what it is that you're doing. So there were times when it was extremely tough to be able to do that. And very, you know, very stressful, which, which has always, which has had an impact on my health as well at the same time. So it's, you know, don't ever underestimate the level of stress that you're putting your body under. Um, and every, everyone has a different, your body has a different way of screaming at you to say enough's enough. Like you need to back off for a little bit. And it's important to listen to that and listen to your health, uh, whether that's physically or mentally. Um, uh, but the other times as well of where we have, uh, I, I'll give you an example of where we had some stuff with Apple. <laughs> so we were launching a um, custom, we asked the map feature uh, that was on our, um, <coughs> the week that we did, you know, that I, I just spoke about a second ago that was, you could brand the app to match your own business and that would stick on the iOS or on the Play Store. And we launched this feature and we were charging um, £99 as a one-off fee to um uh, for us to white label your app if you like to match your own personal training business now um we had an ios developer account that was available at the time so what we were doing is we were charging we were charging personal trainers 99 pounds and we would go away and we would white label our ios and our android app and we would distribute them and we would put them on our developer account on the app store now we got up to probably around, around about, I would say, seven, 800 apps um, that, uh, you know, that were on our account. And we had another one, we had seven, 800 apps on our, on our app, um, on our Android account. And we came into work the next morning and Apple had pulled every single one off of the app store, including our own. And they said, you're, you're spamming our app store. You can't do this. You can't, you can't do it. And this is Apple. Uh, and this is Apple. And this is thinking like, so here's my PT hub, which is two and a half years, years in. It's got four people working for, for it. That's just taken 800 multiplied by 99 off of these personal trainers, which by the way, they could only get if they had an active subscription with us at the time. So the, the effect is not just 800 multiplied by 99 here where people are going to go, where's my app? It's also the knock on effect of people going to go, well, I'm going to cancel my account with you because I can't, I want, I bought a subscription with you to get a customer because I wanted it to be branded. So you're sitting there and you're genuinely thinking to yourself, Oh my God, what are we going to do? Are you going to have a conversation? How am I going to have a conversation with Apple, which says, um, that, Oh no, no, no. In fact, actually I remember posting the question to Apple's um, review board tips. I don't know if you know when you submit an app through, if it gets rejected, there's a review board that sits on top of that, that you can, um, that you can dispute um, a dispute with, if that makes sense of where they will look at each case individually and go, right. Okay. Right. Because the guidelines that are written are deliberately in place to be a little bit, you know, bit hit and miss a little bit gray around the edges on certain things which is which is fine like that's that's all good and i remember posting this question to them saying is this a commercial thing like is this a thing whereby we um if we asked personal trainers to set up their own ios developer account that we're all paying 79 pounds per year and they went on to would that would that solve it and the answer was no it doesn't solve it because we don't want, it's like we don't want to have 800 versions of Instagram on the App Store. We don't want to have 800 versions of Facebook, of WhatsApp. Like, just because you download WhatsApp and it's got a different icon doesn't make it a different app. And they classified it as spam on the, on the stores. Um, but turns out that it wasn't just my PT Hub that was falling into this category. I remember doing it at the same time. I was like, well, if you're going to pull me down, I'm going to pull other people down on the app store and say, well, if you've let them do it, why are you not letting me do it? And I remember bringing up people like the Premier League, other apps and stuff where they would white label their apps and they'd have it in a different thing. I was like, well, if you're doing it to me, you're sure as hell doing it to them as well at the same time. Um, but then it was in iOS, I think it was in iOS 10.2 or something along those lines. 
they introduced a uh, feature called the icon switcher, which enabled you to download an app. And then when you're in the app, you could switch the icon out on. So, so you could download my PT hub based on authentication. You could switch the app icon out to match a different icon. And it was like, Oh my God, Eureka. Like we, this has happened at the same time of where our backs are really up against the wall. We didn't know what to do. We were saying to our customers, yeah, yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're trying to get something done without. And the last portal call was, we're going to have to refund you because, and, and bearing in mind, we were a business at the time of where we were using our revenue as working capital. So we're like, well, if I refunded people, I don't have enough money in my bank account to refund these people. Like what's going to happen here? Um, but they launched this app switcher that enabled you to log into an app and to be able to um, switch the app icon out based on authentication. So what we did was we took every, every personal trainer's account and every client that sat underneath it and we assigned the app icon to their user ID in the database. So then when somebody then logged into it, it said a new app icon is available. Do you want to save it? And he said, yes, it closed the app down. You'd see your icon and then it would launch the app again. And then the rest of the branding was then pulled in via the API for us to be able to do it. So we knew that we could get around that. That then got us back up onto the app store and got people working back on it again to be able to use. And what we did is we said, right, we're not, we're not charging 99 for it anymore. We're going to charge 79 for it because the level of customization now has dropped because you can't change the name of the app. It still says my PT hub underneath it, but the icon and the branding has now switched and changed. So there was one of those moments of where you genuinely thought, this is it, like, this is, this is, this is going to cripple. It's gonna, and, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Um, but fast forwarding a few years, um, the stance on Apple now has now changed. And I've had confirmation from them saying, oh, you want to do that? Yeah, that's fine. Just set up another developer account to be able to do it. And you think... Like, why could I not have, why could you not have said that to me two years ago? Because that would have been so much easier for us to be able to use. Um, so, yeah, so that was a situation. But I tell you what we did to do throughout that entire process is that we kept our communication with our customers updated all the time. Even if we didn't have anything new to say, it was a case of, hey, we just want to check in with you again to let you know that this is what we're doing and what we're working on. And we got praise by our customers because a number of our competitors were doing this as well and they decided not to go down the route of communication. They thought, we'll keep quiet until we actually know something that we can say and we can do. But we kept our customers consistently updated with what we were doing, going, this is what we have done today to try and rectify this. And then the next day it would be, this is what we have done today. This is where we're at with it. And we got praise and we actually got quite a lot of reviews on different platforms online from our customers saying, look, this was clearly an issue that they were trying to solve and they were trying to, to rectify. Uh, and we got some really good praise from that and really good reviews and, you know, and, and, and from it. So, so yet to, to go back to your, your question there, James, personally, you know, it's difficult to, uh, to take bad news or criticism from people at certain times financially it's difficult but there are ways of ways around that of being able to help that grow but also there are things that come out of the woodwork which will hit you sideways but it's amazing what you can do when you're backed into a corner and what you have to do to be able to um, to move that point so it definitely hasn't been roses all the way through there's there's been some tough times <laughs> it's really interesting to hear that um, I, I guess a lot of it is how, how you respond to these situations too. And it is quite emotional. I mean, you talked about, you know, the gut and the vision and that's really, really important. And it, I, I guess everything we build as humans, it, it comes from that emotion, um, but not to get side railed or, you know, how do you kind of keep your wits about you and, and keep a level head when you're dealing with either, you know, personal financial uh, challenges or whether, you know, your business has been hit with a curveball that like, you know, a big company like Apple threw at you. Um, it's really inspiring to to learn how you kind of navigated that and um, and got you know and got through that. So recently, um, my PT hub was sold to EverCommerce. Um, in fact, that was just very recent. It wasn't that it was in December. Um, and you've been on a five six year journey um, to build up to that exit. Can you talk a bit about how that feels? <laughs> because this is your baby, um, and you've clearly just nailed it. Uh, um, and you know it would be interesting to to uh, share with our listeners you know what was the impetus to actually decide to 
to sell um, and then you know how you feel after it and I know that you're still um, you know, you are you are the CEO uh, still um, so yeah how does that feel can you talk a bit about a bit about the the overall kind of ramp up to, to sale yeah sure so it actually stands back right back to the beginning which was um, I built this business because I knew I wanted to sell it one day that was my exit plan uh, was to grow and for it to become acquired by a, a bigger player. Um, if I'm brutally honest with you, um, I didn't think 2020 was going to be the year that we sold. Uh, if you'd asked me the question, when do you think that you'll try to sell the business or when do you think will be a good point to sell the business? I actually would have answered end of 2021, probably more 2022 because there were a number of products and features that we were working on and we still are working on at the moment, which are, which have taken, which are taking quite a long time for us to, um, for us to piece together and put together. But the, I tell you that, so actually it was in, um, it was in March of 2020. I, I, we've been contacted for quite some time around uh, private equity. Uh, so Evercommerce is backed by the way, by two, huge private equity firm so uh, provenance equity and silver lake partners over in the united states and they've got some huge companies that sit underneath those um uh, underneath their portfolio but um over the course of the last year and a half two years or so we have had quite a number of um companies get in contact with us to you know to to discuss acquisition and that have been that that's come from parties that have been strategic buyouts and that's also been from parties that wanted to get involved because they can see their this product complementing other, you know, other fitness orientated businesses that they may already own with inside their portfolio. Um, but for me, it was it was always a case of um, looking at it, going, well, when we when we sell this, a lot of people think that when you sell it, you're just going to sell it to the highest bidder, or you're going to sell it to the person who's prepared to pay you the most. And that hasn't, whilst, whilst the money is a factor, uh, there's, there's no denying that, um, it is important to recognise that for every decision that you make as the chief executive or as the person, you know, steering the ship, there is a human being at the end of every decision that you have to make. And what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to sell the business to somebody that wanted to come along strip the thing apart or you know kill the brand and swallow up into something else and buy it in a way which was you know that meant that there's no future for the business there as my pt hub standing on its own two feet um so for me you know when when you know when a number of these parties were contacting us because we did have a number of people that were competing against each other to bid for the business at a, at a you know, at, at the at the point in you know mid twenty twenty, um, but the reason why I went with EverCommerce over other other you know other buyers at the time was they they clearly had a lot of experience in the software space. Um, I think you know now they're up to roughly around about their fiftieth acquisition that they've done over the course of the last couple of years. So they are. They are serial acquirers um, is probably the, the you know the way to describe them from that factor, but they have been but they are predominantly or they in fact they're all inside the software space so I'm instantly having a communicate you know I'm instantly talking to people who get software um, there were a number of the people that wanted to buy us that weren't in the software space but knew that they needed to buy software in but I want to have a conversation with somebody who's, you know, if I'm now reporting into senior people with inside a corporation, I want to have a conversation with somebody that understands tech, who understands software, knows what it is that I'm talking about, because that is the guts of the product. And that is that we are a tech business that happens to be in the fitness industry is the way that I describe my PT hub. And I wanted to, I wanted to align myself with other businesses that they already owned, which I knew would complement where we were at. So one of the big drivers for us was there was a there's a really big um, club management software provider that they already own called Clubwise, which is based in the UK, which I know are very, very heavily inside the independent gyms um, here, not just here, but also in Australia as well. And they're starting to make quite a lot of noise in South Africa that I knew that by us working with them, 
we would our products would complement each other. They they're in the club space. We know that there are clubs that want to get involved with us more. So what better way of being able to go to a go to a potential future customer and say, oh, your problem's not just in PT, but it's also in club. By the way, these two solutions work hand in hand, and they can be there for you to be able to move forward. So for me, it was a case of throughout the diligence process was understanding what their vision was and where they wanted to take the business just as much as they wanted to to deep dive into into us and understand where we were going and what we were doing so i really i really kind of enjoyed that but it was also a bit um it was a bit bit bizarre in a way of where um you've done a cross so evercommerce are um <clears throat> an american an american company and doing a deal where you've never actually met anybody you i've never met anyone at ever commerce in real life i've never met them uh, uh, you know i i could tell you what the insides of their house look like and what you know and, and and people that i speak to but i've never met i've never met these individuals and trying to build up a rapport over a zoom call is is, is difficult to be able to you know and and to be able to kind of culturally fit the two businesses in there it was so it was, it was building up that over a period of time um and but also personally you, you kind of you, you get you fixate on this point in time of when you think that you're going to sell this business or you want to be able to sell but he, uh personally as well it's it's been quite uh, been a bit of an emotional roller coaster because normally you when something as big as this or as monumental as this point is in time for you know for you selling your company um to be to not be able to go and see your friends, to not be able to go and see your family, to, I haven't even been out for dinner with my mum and dad or my brother and sister to celebrate what we, what we've done over the last six years. But I haven't been able to do any of that. And it's, it, <laughs> it's very easy to sit here and say, Oh, but it's all right for you because you know, economically you've done well out of this and the business has grown and you, you know, you've had your payout, but actually, <laughs> what it's done is it's reinforced that how important it is to have your friends and family around <laughs> to, be able to celebrate these wins and to be able to kind of enjoy this stuff. And so I, for one at the moment are, you know, I want to, I want to be with my friends and family <laughs> to, um, to really kind of enjoy that. Uh, and I can't right. wait to come out of this lockdown situation to be able to go for dinner, go for dinner with them and go, we did it. It was great. Um, it was, it was very bizarre going into an office, signing some paperwork, essentially refreshing your online banking and then going home and then going, oh. So bizarre. Oh, that's that done then. Okay. Like, <laughs> it, um, it, it really is. I like the refresh comment. That's brilliant. Hey, refresh. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, hey. Like, and, hey. Oh, <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, and do you know what? I wasn't even using, in, you know, like if you go through the time where you use inspect element on Chrome or something along those lines and, you know, change your bank balance, go, oh, look at what it would look like. <laughs> like this. And, um, now you've refreshed it and you go, oh, okay, cool. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's, um, I, I'm definitely not trying to say that. I know a lot of people have been through some very, very, very hard times over the course of the last 12 months. And I'm absolutely not saying in any way, shape or form that um, that I'm, it's been hard for, for me, but it, cause it, it, there are certain things that it's clearly not been very hard and it's like, Oh, from it, but from the other factor of, you know, it's, it's like, if you get a new job or, you know, you, you achieve something in life, you want to be able to achieve, you want to celebrate that with your friends and family and it's difficult not to, to be in that, to, to be in that place. So, um, it's, yeah, I guess that's, that, that's kind of like where I'm at at this moment in time. Um, so yeah interesting yeah i actually think that's that's a really interesting point how you mentioned you went to the office refresh but actually you wanted to celebrate with the family the friends that surround you and it's that this kind of pandemic the change has kind of forced you to to realize what you had around you and you've been connected with family and friends and i do think that's an interesting point that obviously a lot of people go into business and that to make lots of money but actually after you've come to the other side you just wanted to celebrate with that network around you and i think that's that's a really interesting point that after all of it you just wanted to celebrate with your friends and family and be with them mm -hmm. um so i think that's a great point and actually one thing that i wanted to jump back on i know we are rapidly running out of time i think we've already gone over the hour mark but one thing that's interesting to me is your experience with university now 
I just wanted to get a quick insight from you about your thoughts on university because I personally did an apprenticeship so following college I took on an apprenticeship I did that for 18 months and then finished and went into business but there was that decision of do I go to university what do I what am I going to university for am I just going to build up a load of debt what was your influence did you did you feel going to university benefited you would you have made a different decision now looking back what's your thoughts on that very very interesting um okay so if I asked myself, if I asked my seventeen-year-old self, why did you go to university? Um, it was because I, I remember having a conversation with my dad, and my dad said to me, um, I, "I knew I wanted to get into business in some way, shape, or form." And I remember having a conversation with him of where he said, "Well, if we're going, if you're going to go to university, there's a number of reasons why. I think a, Phil, you probably need to do some growing up, and." living away from home will help with growing up will you will have some form of responsibilities to be able to you have to fend for yourself and do all the you know you're not going to be left out you know in the cold to try and work out what you're going to do but um you know suddenly you do all the sorts of things your parents normally have done before so you start to you start to grow up in a sense of you know understanding what it's like to be more independent i was never i've never been academic I C grades at best, C maybe a B if I've managed to wing it in some way, right. shape or form. Me too, me too. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. You, you, you know what I find really funny, right? Before I go back to the university thing, is um I remember it, I remember GCSE geography, it was um I did a I did a, a bit of coursework on Gatwick Airport and I remember my dad really helped me out throughout that coursework. And um I managed to get an A in it. Uh, and it was I was I think to myself, it's the first time I've ever got an A. I walked out of geography. So basically bearing in mind that you remember at the time when coursework had quite a heavy weighting towards, you know, what your overall grade would be. I walked out of GCSE geography with a C and I, like my, my French, but I, I said to my dad afterwards, I really have got to screwed up like the exam here to have gone from an A to a C. I must have got a B or an E in my exam to have really brought that weight down. And he was like, Oh God, but, but, just as well, I got thing, you know. Otherwise, I probably would have failed it. Um, but, uh, but, but anyway. So I've never been very academic with that, and and I went to Portsmouth University mainly because it wasn't too far away from home, but it was far enough to not just be twenty minutes down the road, so I could quickly get home. Um, I liked the fact is that they were one of the few um, universities in the country which were talking about this notion of entrepreneurism and um and they they took all of the academic elements of what a business studies degree would have but chucked in a sandwich year of where it was we want you to kind of go out into the field and start doing your own thing and you would have a couple of subjects that you could talk about which were more um personal or opinion based as opposed to necessarily this is what this textbook said in 1960 so therefore that's still correct because as we know, some of those principles still apply, but the world has changed significantly um, since then. Uh, but I, um, knowing what I know about university now, when I was at Portsmouth, I, I met the people which got me into doing stuff with DJing, and I absolutely loved that. So I was the guy that was DJing at the university um, at evenings i was the one doing all the club nights whilst all my mates were on the dance floor i was the one playing the music and it was such a brilliant feeling to have but also i met um i met a number of the people who uh so i met a guy called chris phillips who owned a business called just develop it down in portsmouth i met him through a network of people that i knew down at portsmouth who subsequently then um invested into my pt hub because they have built and sold many tech products over time so the network of people that I met when I was at university shaped and changed my life forever. The, the physical bit at being university and coming out with a 2-2, which was annoying because I, was, I think I was 1.5% of a 2-1. Like, it's like, oh, I'm always just that little bit too low with academic stuff or whatever. But the stuff that I learned at university, I remember some of the academic theory, but I don't remember it all. I've probably applied some of it in some way, shape or form without knowing that I've done that. Um, someone would go, oh, no, that's that theory that you did inside the business. I go, oh, was it? Well, it just felt right at the time. 
Um, but it's the people that I met, the networking that I did, and the um, the independence that it gave me that I really needed to do at the time to be able to kind of grow up uh, and become who I've who I'm shaping up to be today. Uh, and I still keep in contact with some of those people because I believe that networking and being with them is so vitally important. And I will still call them to this day and say, I've got a problem. What do you think about this? I still got people down there from the, you know, from the nightclub industry who were running massive events, big festivals across the country. Well, they were. Um, and, and I can still call them and still talk to them and say, Oh, we, you know, this person's playing this weekend. Do you want to come, do you want to come and see them? And I'm like, Oh, that'd be great. Like it, it, it's, you never know where you kind of meet these people in the future. So that for me was the biggest things I got out of university. But now I actually go back and guest lecture at Portsmouth uni around with a lot of students. Um, and I, I'm the guy who kind of goes in and talks about everything that's non-academic. And it's funny how they really love that. Uh, I, I mentor quite a lot of students down there who, who want to set up tech businesses and who want to be able to do certain things. And I absolutely love it. It's, it's great standing in the lecture room theatre one that I used to sit in, which was like going into a cine world, massive screen with an IMAX screen behind you doing a presentation. And I think, think to myself, first time I did it, how the hell am I standing here? Like, I don't know what, you know, but... But actually what you do know is all the stuff that they, they want to know. They're learning the theory. But they want to do the practical stuff and they want to get involved with it. And it's nice to see a university embracing that and being part of it and not, not looking at my credentials and going, we have to have somebody stand at the front here who's got a first class degree in something. Actually, it's the guy who that believed in what they wanted to be able to do, built something, grew it, sold it. Right, we want to get more of those people in because that's the people that the students listen to. Uh, real world yeah, exactly as you say yeah real world stuff so for me that that's I, I don't know if that answers the question around university but um every journey is different everyone's individual situations are different um but it's now being in a position now of where i was the i was actually the first year of students that um where the the price of a, stu of a student loan like tripled whatever it was um uh, it's actually it was great the other um it was great last month calling them up and they're saying oh your bill's this for the rest of it and i went yeah i'll just pay off like it's it was such a nice feeling to be able to have it you know uh, that's brilliant that's brilliant so um as, as we kind of uh, wrap up um what if you could give one bit of advice for our listeners um whatever stage they're up they're at um what what would that be uh i would say just you got to you just got to keep going and you just got to keep trusting what it is that you're doing and, wh and where you're going with things um from a tech perspective the way i always answer this is it's product 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 you've got to make the product really good if you are building something that you wouldn't want to use yourself then you've got a question as to why i used to track my fitness using my own app and i enjoyed tracking my fitness on our own app and if if you're building something which um, you don't believe in or you're doing it simply because you want to make a load of money at the end of it that won't happen that that there's very very few people that get into that I would build something and I would enjoy doing what you're doing because the days of when it's tough you know there's not a single day that went past over the last six years of where I woke up on a Monday morning going oh I've got to do work again I never defined it as work it was always I absolutely love doing what I'm doing and I enjoy the fact is that every day is different and if you can find and you're and you're working on something that you really genuinely enjoy doing and you want to make it better and better and better it will become better and better and better the harder you work the luckier you become like it's it's, it's as simple as that um, and I think um, it's that's the advice I'd give to somebody is just keep progressing forward and surround yourself with the best possible talented people that you can find to think that you can do it all on your own is extremely naive. Like you need other people around you to bounce ideas off, talk to people, hire people that are better than you because by proxy you will benefit. So I guess that would be, that would be my, my exiting angle. <laughs> that's perfect. And Peter, uh, yeah. Do you have a question for Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I really enjoyed just listening to all of that, um, especially just setting up the website at 15. That was something that I did, um, just learning how to use Dreamweaver and yeah, just using the tables and 
copying other people's websites and figuring it out and kind of back engineering it. Um, yeah, it's a great way to learn. Um, I just wanted to ask, where do you get your ideas and energy from? And uh, do you have any kind of, not tools, but what? how do you cultivate those? Like you've mentioned music a lot, obviously exercise. Um, but yeah, where do you get your ideas and energy um, from? If I'm honest with you, I never stop thinking about this stuff. I, um, my notes on my phone um, are littered with stuff, which everything from that's got some viability to it all the way through to, Phil, what the hell were you thinking when you wrote that down? Like, terrible idea. There's a reason why no one has done that. Like, don't do it. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I actually get a lot of my creativity uh, from talking to people actually um there's the two angles that i'm really into my i'm really into my cars and i absolutely i enjoy going this has always been quite difficult for me i enjoy going for a drive and going where are you going i don't know i'm just going to go for a drive because i'm just going to ponder and think for a little bit but i get a lot of um a, a real big buzz from just we we set up sometimes meetings which are we don't even know what they are we don't really call them a meeting we call them uh we call them like that tools or something along those lines of where the essence of this is to come away with something at the end of it where we've all had some uh creativity uh, during that period of time just to spark different ideas and think of different different things um and gradually over time my ideas have naturally started to sway more towards ones that are thinking about how would you market this and how would you sell it and how would you build something because that's just typically where my experience has now kind of forced me to to think. Some of the ideas I had right back at the beginning were just sort of like, oh, you know, we could we could build a, a website that does this. And you'd go, how the hell is that going to make money? What, what are you going to do? Like, and and don't give me the answer of, oh, we're just going to put adverts on it. You think, oh, like, like, do you know what I mean? Like you're, 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 you're just trying to shoehorn something into an idea here to be able to make it work. But I I speak with people all day every day chatting to them about it i there are there are times where i'll go away for an hour two hours or you know and sit with my ipad and the apple pencil or whatever and i'll just sketch certain things and i'll draw it out and think you know think things through but i've now got a team and a network of people around me that i can call when i want but i can message when i want and i want to be able to do that with other people i want to be able to sit and to be able to say so I'm thinking about this, Phil. What do you think about it? And being devil's advocate, because I want other people to be devil's advocate with the things that I come up with. Um, I wish every idea that I had was everyone else went, oh, that's a brilliant idea. But I quite like the fact is that when I speak to certain people, they go, Phil, that is literally terrible. Like, how on earth are you going to do that? Oh, yeah, I suppose you've got a point, really. Um, and I remember... Um, my first main job um they flew us over to um so i was a I, my first big main job that i had i was a developer for royal and sun alliance with more than com and they flew us over to um to colorado uh and i was a um a css front end developer course over there there's only 10 15 of us and there's a um there's a really there's a like quite an inspiring guy that was talking about technology and he's saying um, and I remember the opening part of his presentation talking about it's 10 o'clock at night and you've come up with this amazing idea. Guess what? Go to bed. Oh, it's 11 o'clock at night and you want to make a change to your website. Guess what? Go to bed. And the more I've thought about that, the more over the course of the last, the last like five or six years, and I feel like it's got to 10 o'clock at night and I've gone, I've got this amazing idea. I'll tell you what I do is I write it down and I go to bed because then the next morning I wake up and I go, Hmm, was that such a good thing to be able to do? Oh, and by the way, I'm now I'm not absolutely shattered because I didn't go to bed at two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's a lot more of my ideas come from just bouncing them off with other people, talking them through, uh, and then you know, because ideas in their original format are so fragile, um, um, and just kind of like you know, building it through from there, I guess. Nice, so yeah, that really connects into kind of the university thing and just building that network whether you go to university or not, just how important that is and having people around you. Great. Thank you. Cool.
Yeah, we'll try and we'll try and blend in. So, Phil, just one final thing before we wrap up today. Where can people follow you on social media? Have you got LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter? Where can they find you? Uh, yeah, so my my Facebook and my Instagram is extremely locked down because I'm quite a private person with those sorts of things. Um, but by all means, add me on LinkedIn. Uh, you'll just be able to search for, you know, for Phil Carr on there. Or if you search for my PT Hub, you'll find me through there and just connect with me and, you know, drop me. A I do as much as I possibly can to get back to people and uh, you know, to, to talk through, uh, talk through those, um, through that channel. So that's how you can get in contact with me. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Phil, for your time. It's been really, it's been a really enjoyable, insightful conversation. Um, thanks so much for sharing your ideas. And I, I'm sure our listeners will appreciate that. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Rocket Pod. Join us next week as we sit down with Daniel Priestley, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and international speaker. That is definitely a conversation you do not want to miss. Thank you to our sponsor, Flexi, who is the mecca for all your subscriptions. Download the app from the App Store today. That's F-L-E-X-Y. Start managing all your subscriptions from one dashboard. Check us out on social media at We Are Rocket Pod. Hit that subscribe button. Have an awesome week, and we'll see you next time.